All righty, it is now time to get started with our closing reflections for our last day of the 2024 Just Transition Summit. It has been an honor and a pleasure. We have four marvelous elders here to share reflections including Aquan Tribal Spokesperson Fran Houston on our left here. Yeah. We have Robert Thompson of Kaktovic. We have, we have here Marie Kachiak. And then on the farthest end, we have I Wagihi. Apologies if I butchered that. <laughs> And uh, before we get started with our elder reflections, I'm asking Ine and Tierra to come forward. They have a short reflection to share as well. Okay. Well, uh, we, we just want to thank you all for your listening ears and, and um, we know that when we will recall our agreements that we made at the beginning of this summit. And I don't know if folks can recall this, but they're actually written in the, in the program. And one of those agreements is that stories stay, lessons leave. And that agreement means that we don't share other people's story without consent. We don't, uh, we, we can share the learnings but we don't share their stories unless we've, we've, asked, we've received consent from people. And so I just want to, we're up here to apologize for um, some, of the, some stories that were alluded to um, that were not consented on in our last, um, one of the last keynote that we had. Um, and so, there was some, a slide with various people's photos on it, and while I think the, the intention of that point was one of taking accountability for one's own actions, we want to recognize that there was harm caused when people's faces were put up there in a way in which did not, um, was not consenting. And we don't know the stories, and they were not given a chance to share their stories. And people have complex uh, lives. And so we recognize that, you know, while this is an effort of accountability, the accountability without care can cause a lot of harm, can cause further harm. And so we apologize if anyone felt harmed by that. Thank you, Ine. Um, because of that, it changed the nature, yes. Thank you. It changed the nature of the space slightly. Um, you all have doing a, been doing a wonderful job of telling me, thank you for all the work that you're doing. And I want to tell you, thank you. This space is warm, and it is light, and it is full of love because of everything that you have brought here. Um, it wouldn't be what it is without all of the investment that you have to, again, bring that life and that warmth and the laughter and the celebration. Um, so it is us, it is you, we apologize, and we want to move forward um, in a positive and holistic way. Ganesh mm Chish. -hmm. All right. Can we take a collective breath? Breathe in and out. One more, in and out. Thank you all for being here with us. I'm now gonna hand it over to our illustrious elders. Okay, my name is Robert Thompson. I'm from Cocktobic, Alaska. It's uh, on Barter Island, it's a little island in the Arctic Ocean. And well, first I want to say the first, about the first time I realized I was an elder, uh, the Mohawk people invited us to a dinner in Montreal. And the leader of the group said, as is our custom, that 
we'll have the elders uh, go to the head of the line or, or serve them first. So I was sitting there waiting for some old guy to get up and start start us off. And my friend, he was a he was an elder, he was 70, and I was only about 62 or whatever. So he elbowed me and said, hey, that's us, they're waiting for us to go up and start the, start the uh, uh, proceeding for the meal. And I said, it's kind of startled me to all of a sudden realize that, hey, I was an elder. <laughs> and there's several other things along the way that now I'm now I'm comfortable with it, <laughs> and um, but I think uh, what I got out of this event is meeting new people and realizing that some of the other areas have very similar problems or situations to us. At one point, I bring some things up like in the interior. Oh, the North Slope that that's a regional thing. We don't, we're not going to deal with that, but. We're all in it together. And what I see is the biggest issue we all have to deal with is climate change. In, in some ways, well, maybe some people don't realize it at this moment, but it will happen to you. The things that we are ha experiencing on the North Slope is, are, to us, is very serious. And maybe it's not quite so much now, but when you look at uh, interior Alaska, the Yukon River is closed to fishing. And it's been closed for four years, and just a few days ago I heard that it'll be closed for seven more years. If, if they do everything they can to bring back the fishery, the, the cycle will take seven years before they can do it again. So maybe, I don't know what particular issue, <coughs> issue is happening here, but there will be uh, effects on, on, in every region, I believe. And the one thing that I would like to see is all of us Native people, not to be divided, but to, to go after this issue collectively. If everybody gets on it, we can mitigate it to some degree. Uh, the issue I see where I live is, uh, and if, if you just went there and uh, oh, it's a nice day and no big things happening, but when you realize, like we have polar bears, there, there's a bio, biologist report indicates they will be extinct in Alaska by 2050. Well, a lot of people, oh, what's a polar bear? Never, never saw one. And, and then we have other wildlife situations, like my home is within the borders of Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Previously, we had, uh, 400 muskox. Now the last I, uh, report I heard, and I asked everybody that's been up there, there's one left. We're probably not ever going to have muskox there again. We get uh, climate conditions like rain in the winter time, which is very unusual to be rained on in, in uh, February. Uh, I gave a talk once in D.C. and they said, what? What effects are you having? <laughs> I said, and, we need, and George Bush said, we need more scientific evidence. And I said, I'm an Eskimo person on the North Slope being rained on in February. I don't need any more scientific evidence. It's strange. And uh, so, okay, so some people might say, oh, that's nice, you get a little warmer. But what it does, the rain, freezes the food. I, I've got pictures of uh, 200 caribou died on our island because they were ingesting ice with their food. And, and the latest thing I'm aware of, uh, and I can say this because I'm old, I hunted up there with people 50 years ago and there was lots of doll sheep. I mean, we'd, we'd go out and, and see, you know, uh, 40 or 50 sheep in a group. I was there last summer and we saw five or nine days. The, the sheep are dying off because when it rains, it freezes their food. All the, all the mountain ridges are wind blown. And when it rains, we had two inches of rain. It froze the food and now the sheep are dying off. So it's not just the Yukon River. And there's various theories on the fishery, uh, decline, fishery decline in the Yukon River. But I attended a, a meeting where biologists presented and they said it's because of climate change. The areas where the fish spawn, 
the water temperature is 87 degrees. It's too warm. It doesn't have uh, uh, the oxygen that you need. So, and then I got friends in Nome area and they talk about windrows of birds that died because the fish that they would go there for died. And then you got the story of 10 billion crabs in the Bering Sea that died, all climate change related. And so this, that is something that uh, we've got to keep in mind and do something about. You come to Juno and now they want to open a new oil field on the North Slope. They call Willow. And they say, oh, they said gleeful about it. We'll have a new economy of oil. Well, they didn't solve all the problems with 46 years, 47 years of oil production. And so to get a new oil field so they can get a reprieve and, and so they're doing well. No, I would say we got to, if they don't do what we want, we got to fire them and get somebody else that will. Because this is so serious that uh, just about everybody's going to be affected. I can't think we're going to get out of this. Uh, the only thing we can do is uh, mitigate it by doing what we can. And I would say on, in this situation, if we could stop the Willow project, that's projected and they're all happy about it. We'll have an oil economy for 30 years. But just about everything we're having adversely, uh, uh, that's adversely affecting us is tied into climate change. So the lawyers say, well, you can't prove that that contamination or the oil, uh, the climate change came from a particular area, but Alaska produced like 17 billion barrels of oil over the time, and I'm sure that contributed to climate change in some way. So I'd say, we, we got to put a stop to it. Well, it stops the economy. But I think, I think we are resourceful enough that we can come up with economy. We, we lived here for 10,000 years before an oil economy. I think we can continue on. So we might have to go back to some of the things we did before, but that wasn't bad in my mind. I, I was at a breakout thing yesterday and somebody said, we gotta have oil so old people can have uh, four-wheelers to continue the culture. Well, I, I was, I'm old enough that before four-wheelers four were invented and we survived. So I think we can continue on, but, uh, and there's modern technology that can kick in and, and even if it doesn't, we made it here for a long time without this uh, n new oil economy and everything. I think we gotta go back to that and, and it'll be better for everybody. Somebody said, who, who are you here to represent? And I said, the only people I can think I'd represent is the future generations. Uh, okay, you can look at a situation and say, uh, you know, I think future generations look at us and say they could forgive us up to the point where we realized that we could do something. If we do nothing, what are they gonna think of us? And if, it, you know, several hundred years from now. So I think we ought to go back and do all we can to, uh, we're smart enough to know what the problem is and, and the consequences if we do not. So I would say, well, let's go home and whatever we can do, get out and vote and vote for somebody that's gonna do what we want. And uh, even if it's just that, you know, we, we have a chance and uh, at least future generations can look at us and say, hey, we, we tried, so. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I, think, I think this will be the start of uh, something new for us, something positive. So I, you know, I hear reports of the legislature and all the breaks they give to the oil industry, and then they voted against the education bill. We, we gotta do something. We, we gotta get some people in there that will do what we want. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, elders, good afternoon. I respect you for staying and, and being here with me. You give me a lot of hope. When I look out in the crowd and I don't see people my age, I think, oh, these young folks, they don't know what I'm going to talk about. They wouldn't understand. <laughs> but I see you. I have we've came here. I've met a lot of very smart young people. I see a lot of young people with us. And the mixture of people, when you look out in a crowd, you make me feel safe. 
So I'm glad you're here and you make me feel happy that you have come and you have shared with me. I have learned a lot by coming here. My name is uh, Grokne. It's from the Shagluk area village, the name of Grokne, which means bird. My American name is Marie Kitschiak. I am a Yupik Koyukon citizen of um, the so, uh, and I come from a nation of uh, sovereign people. Um, I always admired people from the lower 48 when I went to school in Haskell. They always just recognized themselves as a nation. And here in Alaska, when I went to Mount Edgecombe, we were formed into a nation. And from that nation of being around people from all over Alaska, I gained strength from them. And that's why today I feel I'm gaining strength from you. You're giving me something. And I, I appreciate you. The biggest concern I have in my villages and around the state of Alaska is hardly nobody likes to talk about um, when our young women go to town. They, 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 there's not enough jobs in the village. So they go to Anchorage and they're preyed on and they're abused. They are thrown only into jobs of housekeeping, dishwashing, or maybe the, um, a um, secretarial job. They don't see the youth as, uh, the women youth as, uh, as some, something of great value. In my culture, a woman is valued much more than a man for the simple reason is we are going to live longer than the man. <laughs> hey, I could. <laughs> and Robert agrees, and he said, that's the way it is. <laughs> uh-huh, so, and I'll tell you, when we're, uh, as the woman, we have to respect the land. We, we learn to do that. We're taught that. We learn to respect the plants. Every plant is valuable to us. We, in, we learn to respect all the animals because regardless of what animal it is, they need each other to survive. There's a little story from my area where I was born was Deloy Cheat, which is known as Holy Cross. And there's four villages there. We call each other Gash because our cultures, everything we do, we do with each other. They're Anvik, Grayling, Shagrik, and Holy Cross. It's on the Yukon River. That's, um, and there was this old grandma named Ellen Savage. When we would be too mischief or we would be thinking we're better than each one village is better than the other, she would remind us the story of the two trees. We have a uh, spruce tree and we have an elder tree. The spruce tree likes to grow tall and have a lot of leaves on the top. And when the wind blows, he's just noisy and he just throws his leaves all over. Whereas the, uh, <laughs> the spruce tree, some of them didn't grow so tall where, where I'm from. But when I came down here to Sitka, Wow, you guys at Juno, you got all kind of big trees. I mean, I wonder if they talk to each other. <laughs> anyway, these, uh, these two were, were having their conversation. And uh, she said to the, 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 the spruce tree said, well, I really don't like you today. And he said, how come? Because she said, I'm trying to think of the plants that's gonna grow under me this spring. And you're making too much noise. And so that, that, that other tree looked down and he said, well, you don't want to like me today. I gotta to say something about you. You smell, it's springtime. You got all this pine coming out of you. And look at your little leaves. And the spruce tree said, but in the end, when your leaves fall, you're gonna feed me. So, the gesture of this whole thing is we all, just like the plants, 
We need each other. Regardless where you come from, I need you. I need you to help me. And I'm so happy you did come. And the other thing I'm going to talk about is, like I was talking about my young ladies that come into the city. And they, stay, they, they have no place to go. Our, all their relatives are usually home. But now that things have changed in my generation of time, we have relatives in the city. But they still have to come home because uh, in order to obtain their food and be, remain strong, they have to come back to the village. I was in a meeting with the state of Alaska many years ago. When they came upon, they were so stunned at the word subsistence. I said, what is that? They said, you know, when you eat something and you hunt and stuff, that's your subsistence. And then they said, is that, uh, we need to have a classification. Is it going to be called employment? Or? And then this guy stood up from, he was from Fairbanks, Alaska, and he said, it's called unemployment. And I looked at him and I said, no, we're, we're employed working at our subsistence year round. Springtime, the geese are coming. Summertime, the fish are there. Fall time, we're getting our berries. Winter time, we're getting fuel for the stove. We're working year round. Then he said, oh, excuse me, but I, I, I don't know what, what, what you're going to call it. And I said, it's my way of life. There's nothing sub, sub about it. In your language, the sub, it don't mean nothing to me. It's my way of life. So I don't feel like my way of life is, your way of life is any superior to my way of life. So if we don't think and keep judging each other, and putting words into somebody else's mouth that we don't even want to hear or even feel like we should use. Because I would never go to your culture, another culture, and tell them, you're beneath me. Because you're not. We're all the same. We're going to get up tomorrow. We're going to say, hello, world. We're going to smile at our children. We'll smile at our honey. We'll smile and we'll be happy. Start your day happy. That blood will go through your body and you will be happy. And if you, things come your way, just look at it and say, this is my path. I'm happy to suffer today. For tomorrow, I'll be better. And uh, we're going down this path of wondering what's going to happen to us in the future. It's a scary thing to always worry like that. If you sit down and think about what you're doing, you're all smart enough to figure it out. You all are. We, we can't help you in any way, but you have to find your own path. And you have to keep putting that foot forward. Even if I'm sick, I'll get up and I'll be happy because I have grandchildren, I have my family, I have my land, I have my people, I have a home to stay, I have my language, I have my surroundings, what I'm familiar with, and I'm happy. But if there's somebody that's not happy with themselves, they can't help another person. You have got to mind self all the time. You mind yourself, and then you can mind other things. And young people out there, you just keep that good smile going and step right on with your life. Mm -hmm. Don't give up. I don't want to hear uh, so-and-so gave up because they decided not to be themselves today. You be, you be kind to yourself, and the world will love you. And I'll say to you, Buhok. <laughs>
and the first people whose traditional lands were on and are a Bachlak, the ultimate greatest grandfather, our creator. And um, <clears throat> all the youth here, um, I too uh, am inspired. I was raised to be humble and um, my clan were known to be very humble and quiet. And that's how I was raised. And uh, I had no experience in this field I'm in now. And who knew I'd be up here today in front of you all. However, um, I never knew there was so much injustice globally. And uh, I've now become a strong voice and advocate for our future generations, like we heard from uh, Robert and um, Miss Marie here. <clears throat> the changes I'm seeing in my community is heart-wrenching. Uh, the food security issue we're facing with the warming of the globe, the warming of the surface of the ocean. If there's no ice, we can't hunt for our uh, walrus, and four species of seal my people depend on during the long winters. 80, 90% of our homes eat only in Qatik because of our isolation. We're in the northern Bering Sea. And um, <clears throat> the, the crisis we're facing from the uh, climate crisis we're facing bird die off, fish die off, seal die off, whale die off in my lifetime. And uh, Delbert Pangawi, who is uh, an elder from my community, two summers, went, two summers ago went to the cliffs about five miles outside of uh, Sivunga or Sivunga. He said, Vai. It was, it was like the twilight zone. He said, it was, normally we have so many cliff birds, the sky's black and so thunderous from all the cliff birds. He, he said there was no cliff birds. And I have a brother who takes his two young children. He's a little bit older than me, an older father. Every summer they go and spring, go to the cliffs to hunt for bird, cliff birds, the auklets. And, uh, and puffins. He, he said he had to make a very difficult choice to tell his children that they couldn't eat the, the aklets. <clears throat> from, the observ from his many years of observation, taking his children and as a child growing up, like his parents brought him, grandparents brought him to those cliffs the many years of observations, the changes in the birds. He said the change in their vomit and poop because they have to regurgitate to feed the, the little uh, oclets, the little their um, chicks. He said the changes that they're seeing, the changes in the birds. He said he had to make a difficult choice and tell his children they couldn't eat them because that's what they looked forward to, to eating those cliff birds. <clears throat> Another alarming um, um, fact I learned is that our Arctic Ocean has the most microplastics. And we're seeing more and more articles each week, each month, of how they're in our breast milk, in the walrus. And only 8% of plastics are ever recycled. With the decline in the fossil fuel industry, there's more push for plastic production. The, carp the chairs we're sitting on, the furniture, foam, uh, also flame retardants. All these newer classic chemicals we're seeing, perfluorinated compounds, how we're being all contaminated without our consent because of where we live in the Arctic from persistent organic pollutants. We now know the Arctic has become a hemispheric sink. These are burdens we didn't create, but we are facing some of the most dis, uh, um, 
health harms, the crash in our food systems, but also uh, more and more science is showing how exposures from toxic chemicals is causing mental health harms. We're losing too many youth. And these toxic chemicals can affect our endocrine, in our endocrine systems, and they can mimic hormones. And these are research we've done on my island. We've had our own community-based project in partnership with the organization I work with, Alaska Community Action on Toxics, with our two tribes on Sivorak, due to the legacy military toxics. And my people have four to 10 times higher PCBs, but we also look at persistent organic pollutants because uh, after we learned the high levels of PCBs in the blood of my people, our leadership wanted us to look at our nakapik and we sampled everything we eat. If it's on our island, we eat it. And it's alarming to, to learn that uh, not only do we have legacy toxic chemicals like PCBs, pesticides, heavy metals, that have, like PCBs were banned decades ago, but they're very persistent. But these newer class of chemicals, that, like PFAS and um, BPA and Ill, uh, chemicals, I, I as a as a mom and, and um, as an adult, younger adult and youth, things we never heard about. But these are things we need to educate ourselves so we can make informed decisions to protect our children, our future generations. It's alarming to learn that my grandson I've been raising since birth, who's four now, has a higher body burden of flame retardants. From the furniture foam, electronic casings, the hard plastic casings. And um, it's so important that um, we learn because not only are we being exposed and it's affecting our health harms, but these toxic chemicals can affect our children's ability to learn. At the direction of our leadership, we sought funding. How can we pass on our languages? How can we pass on our songs and stories, our creation stories, our cultures and traditions? if our children can't learn. In my community, it's not a matter of if we'll get cancer, but when, because of the two Cold War, uh, two Cold War era, formerly used defense sites. It's not a matter of if we'll get cancer, but when. My immediate family was, my parents and siblings was eight. Half of us have gotten cancer. Our also, also, our healthcare system is broken. My father had to pay his way from Nome to Anchorage. By the time we found out he had cancer, it was too late. My mother had a stillborn child after me. Heart disease, strokes, diabetes, mental health harms, and cancer. We buried my brother to cancer two years ago. I'm a cancer survivor, and I've had three miscarriages. Just, that's just in my immediate family. And last year, I lost 10 people in my family, not c c counting the rest of my community. But all, not only uh, cancers, but all other health harms. But what I like to, I'm more passionate about is the mental health harms that we're seeing in our, in our communities. And my, um, you know, we see so many suicides, and these toxic chemicals can change our DNA. In my community, we're seeing more boys getting feminized, and that's why I think we have more suicides in young men. But anyway, please, uh, I give you permission to share my story, share, share what, we're, what you heard from us because it's going to take you, the youth, and the young people in this field. I'm so proud to see so many youth in here, you, because what I've come to learn about how these toxic chemicals and environmental health injustice 
uh, environmental racism, environmental violence that we're facing, our human rights. And uh, I'm so honored to be up here. And um, I want to thank the organizers again and, and what I learned from listening to uh, Robert and um, Marie and f from Fran next. First of all, I'd like to say that I am so happy that what has been shared over the three, the three days, being here, listening to everyone, I've heard from, I've heard from some uh, younger, younger important people, they're, they're our future, so they are uh, here and they're going to follow us elders as to what we've been trying to do here. And uh, to make things work and fall into place. Test, test, okay. I, um, uh, I had a couple of young people come to my table. And we had a nice discussion and what was shared, you know, so, some of us feel hurt. Some of us, uh, we know we have voices. We're, we're sharing. Uh, we're, we're, um, what I see, I really thought it was small steps, but seeing a whole bunch of everyone that's in this room, I feel a lot of positive, and I feel uh, <clears throat> that everything that... Uh, everybody is doing very, very proud of the younger generation. But this one person, well, two of them, I would say, that we had a discussion and they said, you know, we share, we shared. The, I listened to what they had to share and they listened to what I had to share. And then they turn around and says, wow, you know what? I don't feel alone anymore. We don't feel alone anymore because we're here. We're talking to each other. And, and it, it feels good. And when I go home, I'm going to share this with my people. And that's beautiful. That is totally, totally beautiful. And it's not too often you see the younger generation, you know, participating in this. but. That tells me they care like we care. They love what we love. They're protecting what we're trying to protect. And we're trying to make a difference. And this is a beautiful thing. So I am so, uh, I am really glad that I did come. I really did. Uh, I didn't know about this until the night before, so here I am. And uh, I come down here, and I would like to explain why I'm wearing my robe and my headpiece. The headpiece is a ptarmigan. Uh, this represents, this was my grandmother's. So my grandmother is here. And what I'm wearing is my robe. Uh, very proud to say uh, I learned how to make a robe. But what I did is I took off the, uh, <clears throat> in the back, it has the raven, it has the dog salmon, and it has our spirit. And what I did is I took it off the old robe because I had that ever since um, 70s. So I made a new one. So I'm proud to wear this. And the, the raven and the uh, frog-like monster, which is our spirit, these were made by my mother. So my mother's here. And I, uh, I just wanted to show off and be proud of who we are. And then looking at all of you, it, it's, uh, you know, so much my mind's going 100 miles per hour right now, but there is so much that has gone on these last three days. It's totally, totally amazing. 
and it's uh, it is so lots of energy, lots of energy in this big room. And I got to say thank you to all of you, thank you for sharing. We all learned, and what I shared the other day, I had to do that because now I feel. Uh, when, after I shared that, I told myself when I got home that this gave me, looking back to the time of first contact, when we all had to change, it was, uh, when we had first contact, we had to do things their way, they had their laws, we have ours. We knew how to manage our rivers where the salmon run. We learned how to manage our subsistence food. We didn't take more than what we needed. We only took what we needed, I should say. But anyway, uh, it was uh, uh, very important. It worked. Our system worked. But when you're being forced to live in two worlds, some people don't like that phrase, but that's the way it was. So I would like to say thank you to each and every one of you. Uh, it is good to see beautiful faces, but when I first made the welcome and I asked how many is their first time here, and when pretty much all of you raised your hand, that was a lot. And that l uplifted me too. I said, wow, awesome. But anyway, I, I just want to say to all of you that when you go home, you're going to uh, think about what happened here. A lot of, lot of good stuff has been shared. And it is, like I said, it's beautiful. The younger generation, hurrah to all of you. And if I can hug every one of you, I would because I am very, very proud of you, all of you, because younger generation, they're pretty shy yet. But you know what? They listened. They listened to the elders. So they're sharing. They got, they got the same feelings as we do, and which is good because, like I said, they're our future. So when you go home, I want you all to have a safe journey back home. And then when you come back, we can say hi, and we can give each other big hugs. So safe journey to each and every one of you. And while we're sitting here, you look at the people at your table. And I'm gonna use this phrase because I thought it was, it was awesome to use this. I, I take it from a leader, uh, Bless his heart, he's no longer with us. But I want you to say to each and every, look at a person, you are precious. You are precious. Say that to one another. You are precious. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, gonna cheesh, enjoy, and uh, we'll see you next time around. Okay, gonna cheesh. We really appreciate your reflections. Thank you very much. Are you good? So we are at the end. It's time. <laughs> um, I just want to use this end of the day to one, um, share a couple announcements about tomorrow and this evening, but also it's time for some big thank yous. So um, I'll start with announcements. Announcements are, Af this evening's activities are the gold medal basketball tournament. 
Yeah. I believe there's still some um, tickets available. So if you do want to go, please go to the registration desk and get some free complimentary tickets and have some fun. Um, we also hope that all of you who are going to be here tomorrow, before you fly out, you will uh, come out to our rally at the Capitol. It is a climate justice rally. We're specifically going to be talking about just transition related to climate change. And our elder Robert, who was here, is going to be speaking at that rally as well, among many other marvelous speakers that you have seen this week. So. Please come and show your support and show the legislature that we want to see a post-oil future, a regenerative economy in Alaska. Um, that will be starting at 10.45 a.m. So please join us tomorrow morning. Uh, again, if you are going to lobby tomorrow, be sure to talk to uh, Rebecca, Marta, or Jenny Marie if you haven't already. And that concludes my announcements. No, we have one more, I hear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to speak? Okay. Just speak now. Hello? Hello? Here. Hello? 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 Okay. Uh, and before we do our thank yous, we also just want to share a bit about what's next for Just Transition. And I hope you all have signed up um, for the listserv. If you're not already, the Just Transition Collective is you. You are a part of this collective. We want you to help shape this collective and our direction. We know that you were in these regional breakouts and that we're going to be continuing these discussions, these like powerful places where we're building connections around these aligned ideas and visions, and we're going to take those to the regions. So we really want you to stay engaged. Join the listserv. There will be announcements of when we'll have um, next call, open calls and ways for you to become a part of um, a more active part of the coalition and maybe bring some of these into your region, bring a gathering into your region. And, um, and where's Tiara? <laughs> I think that's it, right? We love Ine. <laughs> Everyone round of applause for Ine. <laughs> Okie dokie, on to the thank yous. This has been a uh, long planning process with as so many people. You can't imagine how many people, but I wanna show you how many people. So, those people who were part of organizing it, get your hips warmed up, cause you're gonna stand up and come on up here. I'm gonna call out all the teams that um, that were part of this summit planning. And then as I call out the teams, please give them a warm thank you and come up to the front, um, those people who are on the teams. So the planning teams include the content team. The content team also did a lot of proposal reviews, and so there's a subcommittee of the content team called the proposal review team. Big round of applause for them. We have the accessibility team who made sure this would be safe, welcoming environment. We have the logistics team, which made sure that we all got here today. We have the lobbying team who set up meetings for many folks around here to meet with their legislators. We have the youth team that wanted to make it a welcoming environment for youth, please come. 
our communications team, which made sure you all knew about this summit. Our partnership and outreach team, who, yeah, that's me, I guess. Um, <laughs> We have our fundraising team as well to make sure this could all be paid for. <laughs> our language translation team that created this beautiful phrase. Our scholarship team that also created the opportunity for many people to come to this summit. <laughs> and then even in addition to our core collective partners here, we have many different support staff that made this all possible. We like to give a big shout out to the tech and audio visual team. Look how professional. This was done by KTOO, especially big thanks to Betsy, Miko, Terry, and then Scott, Bob, and George, who are on the cameras. And the food, it was amazing. It was Smokehouse Catering and Sacred Grounds. When you leave here today, please Thank your hotel staff as well. Wherever you are staying, please thank the people who made sure that you were in a comfortable environment. And there have just been so many countless hours that went into this summit. I know there were last minute changes, there was stress, and we had some wonderful um, people that were supporting that. I wanna give a big, 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 Thank you to our steering committee. Please step forward, steering committee. <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. And everyone who attended, big pats on the backs. Can you all come up here so we can take a picture, please? <laughs> And then we're going to close out with a prayer from our elder, Doug Modink. You want to come up? You guys can stay there. You can stay there. So um, back in the day, when we started to work with people in recovery, the, um, the job that we had to do was pretty much impossible because our people are dying, right? They're dying of drugs and alcohol and all those things. Well, we're faced with the same kind of challenge, but in a different way. And um, we ask our um, elders, our ancestors, what do we need to do? to um, make a just transition. And so um, we talked and we visited with each other and we dreamed about it and we talked about it and then the answer came. Actually it came from uh, Heather, put it into words. And the words that she said was, you know back in the day, we used to welcome back the salmon. We used to welcome back the, the birds. Uh, we used to welcome back the seals and the walrus and the whales. And we did that in a prayer way, a prayerful way. In other words, we asked the Creator to help us out. And so uh, some people say, well, we don't do the spirituality thing anymore. Well, some of us do. We do the spirituality thing. Because, you know, we have each other, but I think there's a power greater than each other that encompasses all of us. And that, um, would be for us to begin our welcoming ceremonies, to um, ask for the, uh, uh, the salmon, uh, to tell the, the salmon that, you know, 
we welcome you back. To talk to the birds and say, we welcome you back. To talk to the whales, to talk to the seals. Now we forgot how to do that because we learned how to live in the modern world. Well, what we can do is we can offer up a, a prayer to the Creator to help us out and to remember how, uh, and, and in doing so, what we'll do is access a power greater than ourselves that will help us to find the answer to the perplexing problems that we have right now. You want to expand a little bit? I just want to thank Doug for, for inviting us all in together to create this prayer vision. Let us welcome our relatives home and say, we are still stewards. We honor you. Come home. We love you. Come home. We are all related. Mm -hmm. And we say, aho. Thank you. Gracias. Unfortunately, that is the end. <laughs>